Hello, everyone. First, let me start with our sincere apologies. We had some technical difficulties, but we sure appreciate you hanging in there. We are ready to begin the broadcast, and we're so pleased to have you join us for Cardinal Health Lab Exchange. Today's broadcast is patient safety. I'm Brenda Kelly Kim of Lab Roots, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. And we are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Lab Roots and sponsored by the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Science, the AS. CLS. The mission of ASCLS is to make a positive impact in healthcare through leadership that will assure excellence in the practice of laboratory medicine. For more information, please visit www.ascls.org. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This presentation has been approved for continuing education credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner of the auditorium. This will direct you to the necessary site and form needed to receive your credits. This webcast is also designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions. You can submit your questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, hopefully not, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem to the green Q&A button lower left. Following this presentation, if you have time, head on over to the Community of Learning in the Lab Exchange lobby to have the opportunity to engage in live chat and have more of your questions answered on the spot about patient safety. Now for today's speaker, Susan Morris. Susan Morris has been the Patient Safety Officer at St. Luke's Magic Valley Medical Center since 2006. Prior to that, she was the Director of Ancillary Services for five years after serving as the Laboratory Manager for the institution. In her current position, she manages the performance improvement and patient safety education for this 200-bed regional medical center, including facilitation of root cause analysis teams and conducting failure modes and effects analyses. She has more than 30 years' experience in working and managing hospital laboratories, is a past president of the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Science, past president of the National Credentialing Agency for Laboratory Personnel, and a current member of the Board of Governors of the ASCP Board of Certification. She has numerous publications on improving patient safety, healthcare quality, and delivery, and employing IOM patient safety competencies to introduce quality improvement processes to medical laboratorians. I'll now turn it over to Susan for her presentation. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to be joining you today and talking about patient safety and how it's really impacted by laboratory professionals. I'm going to be talking a little today about the difference between patient safety and laboratory safety. I've worked in medical labs most of my career before transitioning to working full-time in patient safety for the past eight years. In my day-to-day -day activities, I often think back on my own experience in the laboratory and how the patient safety lessons I'm learning today would apply in that environment. When I entered the laboratory profession, I was, it was widely believed that errors were not allowed in the workplace. If an error did occur, emphasis was placed on blaming the individual with the assumption they most likely were not following procedures as they were taught. My experience in patient safety has taught me that it's really important to create a culture of safety within the laboratory that really acknowledges the reality that all humans will make errors and prioritizes learning from those errors, how we can identify and fix faulty processes that may, prevail to pre may fail to prevent errors or keep them from being detected and corrected before they've resulted in unintended harm to patients. I'll also share with you some ways the laboratory professionals can impact patient safety by extending their involvement onto interdisciplinary teams. So errors can and really do happen in healthcare and in laboratory practice. Let me give you one example. A 57-year-old woman had an order for four units of fresh frozen plasma to be transfused following surgery. This patient was blood type A positive, 
So two APOS FFP units were thawed and transfused, and she tolerated this well. Orders were then given to transfuse another two units. John, who was the medical lab scientist scheduled in the blood bank that day, was in the process of performing a stat cross-match for a patient in the emergency department. But he quickly went to the plasma freezer, which happened to be located two rooms down the hall, removed two units of uh, frozen plasma, and then took them back to the blood bank where he placed them into the water bath to thaw. Then going back to his emergency cross match, he finished that and notified the ED that the blood was ready, and then he went to lunch. Oh, but before leaving, he reported off that there were two units of plasma thawing to Marcia, the MLS who was covering the blood bank while he was going to be gone. So Marcia removed the plasma from the bath, labeled them for the patient, and checked them out to the nursing assistant who was sent over to pick them up. Both plasma units were O positive. Marcia did not notice the discrepancy between the plasma blood type and the patient's blood type. She usually depended on the blood bank computer system, which um, would pick that up for her. But in this case, there had been a major update that week of the computer system, and the functionality for alerting the blood type discrepancy had not been tested after the update. And it was not functioning and failed to detect the error. Two RNs verified the patient identified identification and match the blood products to the patient's order. However, they didn't understand the difference between red cells and plasma and assumed that it would not be a problem to transfuse the type O plasma to a type A patient because they'd learned that type O blood was the universal donor. They didn't call the blood bank to clarify. After the plasma was transfused, the patient's hemoglobin level was rechecked, and it had dropped by two grams. The patient received three units of blood and eventually stabilized. This was an error that started as a series of human errors in the laboratory, but then continued to not be recognized or stopped due to the faulty processes in the information system and with the nursing processes. So this is an example in the laboratory world of an error that actually happened. So this epidemic of harm from medical errors continues to happen across the country and was the basis for the Institute of Medicine Breakthrough Report in 1999, which focused the attention of the country on preventing harm that was caused by medical mistakes. So here we are 15 years later and really, patients are not any safer now than they were in 1999. When an airliner crashes, like the recent tragedy in the French Alps, many lives are lost in a single day. We saw an international response to that event of grief, outrage, and fear. And yet, there are 275 lives lost every single day in the United States from healthcare errors, many of them preventable. And there's little or no public rec recognition of this. The evolution of our present day healthcare delivery system has led to unintended harm of huge numbers of patients and their families. So what is patient safety? It is actually harm to patients associated with their health care. Laboratory safety is related to preventing employees from harm from the hazards in the workplace. That would be chemicals, blood and body fluid exposure, fire prevention, disposal of hazardous materials, those kinds of things. Patient safety emphasizes reporting, analysis, and prevention of healthcare errors that can lead to patient harm. The Institute of Medicine's report to Air is Human and Crossing the Quality Chasm both raised public awareness that patients are being harmed at alarming rates from the healthcare that really was intended to help them. This was shocking to most healthcare leaders at that time who believed that we had the safest healthcare system in the world. Patient safety is all about the patient, 
not the employee. And really, it is our professional obligation to take patient safety as our first priority and do all that we can to work in the work environment to protect patients from errors that may be caused by us. So health care culture, as it's developed, is traditionally physician-centric. Organizational structures place them at the top and gives them authority over the rest of the team. Now, this authority is usually not written into policy, but is firmly ingrained in workplace culture. So staff may be reluctant to speak up if they have a safety concern. Over time, healthcare specialties developed into separate units of expertise within the system, and laboratories are one such unit. Many labs exist as a silo of knowledge separated from the rest of the healthcare team by lack of communication, which contributes to fragmented care. We're working side by side, but not together. From the laboratory professional's perspective, our role on the patient care team is to provide answers to diagnostic and treatment planning questions. Laboratory information is often time critical in decision making that can save a patient's life or prevent harm. As members of the healthcare team, we also have opportunities to identify potential process failure areas where errors might occur and we must speak up if we see such a problem. We have a responsibility to work with other members of the healthcare team to find solutions and that'll make our process safer. This kind of contribution requires a different skill set than our current technical competencies. One year following the two errors human report, the Institute of Medicine followed up by publishing Crossing the Quality Chasm, which described a vision of what ideal quality healthcare system of the 21st century should look like. The report outlined six aims or characteristics that are necessary to achieve quality healthcare. That report described the ideal healthcare system as care that is safe, timely, effective, efficient, equitable, and patient-centered. It also stated that all healthcare professionals were not being adequately prepared to provide the highest quality and safety medical care needs. To ensure patient safety, laboratory services should address each of those six IOM aims for providing quality care. So what would that look like? Safe laboratory care provides accurate data. It's reported on the correct patient, reported to the appropriate care provider. Timely laboratory care means that the information is available when it's needed to make care decisions and interventions. Effective laboratory care, appropriate tests are utilized to get the information needed. Efficient laboratory care, eliminating waste and controlling costs of care. Equitable laboratory care, perhaps that would be providing interpreter services for non-English speaking patients so that all have equal access. And patient-centered laboratory care might be answering patient questions about the tests they are receiving. There was a Health Professions Education Summit that was convened by the Institute of Medicine following its two initial reports to develop strategies on how to build the necessary skills into the education of health professionals. And that would be the key to improving quality and safety. So the findings from that pub summit were published in 2003, and that was called A Bridge to Quality. And they all agreed that the one reason for patient harm is that health professionals simply are not prepared during their clinical training to master some competencies that they identified as essential to achieving the six aims. So the missing competencies were 
providing patient-centered care, using evidence-based medicine, using quality improvement principles, use of informatics, and working on interdisciplinary teams. So um, I'd like to stop for a second here and take a quick poll. Brenda will put on for us about, um, I'd like to know if your clinical training covered the six quality aims or the five healthcare competencies. So you can answer yes or no. So, um, Brenda, how does how do we move from this poll on? Do we just results can be shared? It should be showing up on screen for attendees in just a moment. There they are. There we go. All right. So, 25.9% said yes. That is fantastic. That means we are making some progress, and the major, vast majority have not been trained, which is not, not a surprise at this point. <laughs> okay. So close the poll. Okay. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit more, more now about each of these competencies and so how would they look in the laboratory environment. So let's start with becoming patient-centered. Providing patient care in a, the best possible quality is really central to our profession. Although it may not have been thought about as a competency or skill, so Patient involvement really has been widely recognized as an effective way to prevent errors. So that means patients should be actively involved, not passive, while receiving services from the laboratory. No one is more invested than the patient in making sure that nothing goes wrong with their care. There's all kinds of documents and websites found on the Internet that share patient stories. And those patients are really committed to helping other patients become engaged in their health care. This um, report came from the National Patient Safety Foundation, but there are many others out there. So providing patient-centered laboratory care means designing access to care and services that is best for the patient, not necessarily what is most convenient for the care providers. Patient-centered laboratory professionals would check for understanding with their patients by using techniques such as teach back that ask the patient or their advocate who's with them to verbalize just what it was they heard of the information you just told them. And then also encouraging patients to ask questions. If you haven't seen this before, you definitely need to take a look at this website, Lab Tests Online. It is a wonderful patient-centered public resource on clinical lab testing. And the information on this website it gives patients all kinds of information about most laboratory tests in understandable language. The content is peer-reviewed and non-commercial. And patients can also post questions that they have about their tests or their results and they'll get an email response from a laboratory professional answering their questions. So this is a great resource to give out to your patients. Also on the ASCLS website, there are patient-centered materials that you can customize for your laboratory to make up some patient education materials. They are easily customizable templates where you can put your laboratory logo on there. And it's available in English and Spanish for most of these. Laboratories can customize them so that they become their own. So this is, um, gives you a head start on how to get some materials ready for your patients. Oops. And let's see, I skipped, there we go. This is another one you ought to take a look at. It's the Joint Commission website. has a series of brochures called Speak Up. 
And this was a campaign they did together with CMS to give patients information in understandable language about their health care. And they have one, this one uh, that I'm showing you here is called laboratory services, but the messages are very similar between the laboratory brochures and other healthcare brochures for this series. And they have messages such as, um, don't be afraid to ask about safety, quality, or how long it takes to get results. Don't be afraid to tell the health professional if you think they've confused you with another patient. Make sure your sample is labeled with your full name and another piece of identifying information when it is collected. So um, really helps empower the patients to um, have permission to speak up. Patient-centered laboratories communicate significant results promptly and as directly as possible to the ordering physician. And they tell patients about when they can expect that their physician will have those test results. They also explain to them how they can get a copy of their results. And CMS now requires laboratories to make results available to patients. In some cases, patients are told by their physicians that if you don't hear anything from me, it means that your lab results were normal. However, there's many things that can go wrong with that process. No news is not always good news for patients. One 38-year-old man was diagnosed with an abdominal mass. He chose to refer, be referred to a well-known, highly respected major medical system in another state for the surgery. And all went well with the surgical procedure, the tumor was removed, and sent to pathology. The patient was able to return home within 48 hours. But the final rep pathology report had not yet been received by the surgeon, he told the patient he was confident that no additional treatment would be necessary to just consider no news to be good news. He would only need to contact them if there was unexpected findings in the pathology report. The pathologist had identified some malignant cells in the specimen and ordered additional special stains to complete the diagnosis, delaying the final report. When the pathologist attempted to call the findings to the surgeon, he learned that he had left town that morning for a three-week vacation. The report was sent to the surgeon's clinic, but was accidentally misfiled along with another patient's records. One year later, the patient had a recurrence of symptoms, and at that time, he was found to have metastatic disease. He died six months later. His widow has now become an international advocate for patient engagement in their health care. Using evidence-based practice methods is another of the IOM competencies that is essential for providing quality health care. Eliminating outdated lab methods from the test menu and implementing new practice methods is an ongoing responsibility to ensure that physicians are ordering tests that are effective. Laboratory professionals have a responsibility to their patients to read journals and stay current with new developments in laboratory science. In addition, laboratory professionals should be providing education to providers and other healthcare professionals on best practices and algorithms for ordering laboratory tests. Laboratory professionals should be participating on interdisciplinary protocol teams that are implementing research-proven best practices. This might include a transfusion team, a sepsis protocol team, a stroke protocol team, or perhaps an antibiotic stewardship team. Lab professionals should also be participating on interdisciplinary teams that are developing diagnostic algorithms. The majority of healthcare errors are the result of faulty processes. So using quality improvement principles, the third competency identified by the Institute of Medicine is essential to develop a continuous improvement mentality. Continuing and measuring the quality of the care that we deliver 
in terms of structure, process, and the outcomes for patients will lead to the design of improvements that can prevent unintended harm to patients. So data collection and analysis of quality indicators is the key to this. Tracking, trending, and also analyzing those errors are necessary to find the improvement processes needed and reducing future errors. The Joint Commission's National Patient Safety Goals focus on the best practice processes that have, they have data on that affect preventing errors for high risk and error prone processes. So some of those would include verifying two patient identifiers to prevent test information going to the wrong patient, or also timely communication of critical results when delays in treatment could cause serious harm. In order to learn about and study errors, Laboratories must support a culture that allows staff to feel safe to report errors. There are algorithms available such as the Just Culture, which can help guide managers in supporting staff who report errors, while still holding staff accountable when there's a trend of bad choices or reckless behavior. And then there's also the root cause analysis opportunities to dig into those errors after they've happened and understand how did it happen, where did things go wrong, and what could we do to keep that process on track so that this couldn't happen again or be much harder to happen again in the future. So we do need to use a scientific approach when we're changing processes once we have analyzed and found the underlying problems, we need to test those solutions before a widespread distribution of a new process. We can also be proactive in our risk analysis and look at processes that we think have a high likelihood of going to having an error and um, just um, brainstorm what are the things we could do to possibly prevent that from happening and strengthen those processes. Um, the, the method that I use for that is called FMEA, Failure Mode and Effects Analysis. So with your basic improvement model, you have some fundamental questions you're trying to answer. What is it that we're trying to prevent? What are we trying to accomplish here? What changes can we make that will result in an improvement that will make it harder for that to happen? And how will we know that the change has actually made an improvement? So that is when you do the PDSA process, you plan your improvement, you do a trial on a small scale to see if how it's going to work, and then you study how, how did that work out? Was there unexpected problems that came up that we need to adjust the process somewhat, and then you fully implement your new process. Data is essential for convincing others that change has been successful in achieving the goal. So by identifying what you're going to measure and then collecting that data before and after the change is put in place, you'll end up with evidence that can be shared with others in the organization. And I've heard it said that physicians will respond to data when they won't respond to reason. So it's a very strong tool for changing behaviors in the organization. You also want to display your data over time so that you can see at the point where you put in your, implement, your intervention whether that will show you the point where the data should be changing and getting better. And you look for at least three consecutive months of data meeting the target to confirm that the improvement has actually been a success. And then after that point, you can go to periodic checks just to verify that it's being sustained. The fourth competency that's essential for healthcare quality in our current information age is the ability to effectively use informatics. Laboratory professionals need to become experts in the resources and methods for the management of health information. 
to give you an example of how disconnected transfer of information can lead to patient harm, I can tell you about one situation where an abnormal troponin result was discovered by the medical unit charge nurse several hours after the report had printed on their computer. In this small rural hospital, paper reports were printed from the lab computer system and then placed onto patients' paper charts several times each day for the physician to review when they came to do their rounds on their patients. Because it was difficult for the lab to determine when an elevated troponin result would require action, it had not been included on the critical values policy, so the result was not called to the ordering physician. The charge nurse alerted the cardiologist of the result as soon as she found it, but that was later in the afternoon. Since time is muscle with the cardiac patients, it was now the cardiologist's decision to call in the cardiac cath team and proceed to an emergency cardiac cath procedure. A repeat troponin was ordered, but the results were not received until the cath procedure was completed. The second troponin level was normal. It was later determined that the original specimen had contained fibrin clots, which caused a false positive on the test result. Following the unnecessary invasive procedure, the patient said she was at least relieved to learn that her heart was actually normal, but she was exposed to a very risky procedure unnecessarily. Competency in using informatics includes designing and building connected information systems that make a patient's laboratory data available to the electronic medical record system across the continuum of care. It also includes appropriately using electronic methods to facilitate quick and effective communication within the healthcare team. Informatic skills would also be useful in researching publications and best practices. And also, this is a convenient means for assessing, continu accessing continuing education to maintain competency and professional certification. There may be future opportunities for laboratory professionals in developing apps for smartphones for laboratory information. The final competency and possibly the most important of the five is working on interdisciplinary teams. The Joint Commission has identified gaps in coordination and communication between health professionals as the number one contributing factor to Sentinel events. Some common examples of interdisciplinary teams in hospitals include a code blue response team or an antimicrobial stewardship team. You may be able to think of others. If you're not already involved in one of these types of teams, you might start by thinking about what are the key areas you interact with frequently in your work. These are the areas you need to be closely connected to. Teams function by using simple teamwork skills, and that would start with getting to know each other by name and always treating each other with mutual respect. Even within the laboratory environment, there are probably groups that you depend on as part of your work, but that you don't spend time as a team talking about how well your current processes are functioning for all involved. Thinking of yourselves as a team is an important first step. That means you all understand you can achieve better outcomes when you work together as a team. Most of us have not had formal training on how to be part of a team. You may have had some kind of sports team experience at some point in your life, but probably not related to your workplace. Team behavior can be greatly improved for some focused training that identifies the necessary skills and allows team members to practice those behaviors until it feels comfortable and natural. Simulation-based tra training and games provide opportunities in a realistic setting, as some lifelike terrain, to practice those interactions and dynamic situations. You can practice getting and giving feedback and learn how to give others 
permission to give you feedback, making it feel safe for them to do so, and decreasing defensive behaviors. Without this kind of training and practice, team members usually lack the required behavior repertoire to perform effectively. Team Steps is a teamwork training system developed by healthcare professionals in the Department of Defense's Patient Safety Program in collaboration with AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. It includes a comprehensive set of ready-to-use materials and training curriculum to successfully integrate teamwork principles into any healthcare system. More information is available on the ahrq.hhs.gov website, and this information is free and available. The curriculum covers four primary um, do I might have another slide on that. No. So it covers four primary trainable teamwork skills, leadership, communication, situation monitoring, and mutual support. The team leaders learn how to define, clarify, and instill team goals and objectives, effectively communicate methods so that um, teams learn to develop shared mental models. They make shared decisions, and then they dynamically adapt to their priorities. Cross-monitoring means watching each other's back. This skill clearly separates a real team from a group of individuals who just happen to work in the same general location. Team members learn to practice backup behavior so when they do that, they kind of pay attention to what is going on around them. If there's a period of high workload or you're short-staffed, there's a greater chance that somebody on the team might make an error. So team members are constantly aware of that situation. They anticipate what's coming next. They watch out for each other, and they appropriately correct actions to prevent errors from reaching a patient. In team training, the team members practice exchanging and accepting feedback from one another. One another. Um, it has to be more than just a rating of, oh, you did good or that was bad. It should be diagnostic and constructive and give them an individual indication of what they can do to improve. In this quote from William Mayo, founder of the Mayo Clinic, we can see that as early as 1910, laboratory professionals were recognized as essential members of interdisciplinary healthcare teams. It's become necessary to develop medicine as a cooperative science. The clinician, the specialist, and the laboratory workers uniting for the good of the patient, each assisting in elucidation of the problem at hand, and each dependent upon the other for support. In the ideal patient safety culture, optimal safe care is everyone's overarching and non-negotiable goal. No one is ever hesitant to voice a concern about a patient because it is psychologically safe to do so. There's a simple model of accountability that clearly differentiates unsafe individuals from competent, conscientious individuals who fall victim to system errors. And we're constantly learning from the errors that happen so that we can make our processes safer, preventing harm to future patients who depend on laboratory professionals to keep them safe. So I'll stop now and allow some time for questions. Thank you very much, Susan, for that informative presentation. I'm so happy you were able to be with us at Cardinal Health Lab Exchange. And before we get started with questions, I'm just going to remind our audience how to submit them. You can submit your questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button on the lower left of the presentation window. And we're going to try to get to uh, as many questions as we can through that uh, process. And I, I'd like to thank the audience again for hanging in with us on our uh, 
technical issues. We did have to start a few minutes late, but we're glad that you folks are all here and we're able to uh, listen to Susan's presentation. Okay. I'm um, I'm not seeing any questions in our uh, in our Q and A queue. However, uh, we would like to remind you to head on over to the community of learning uh, following today's presentation, and that's an opportunity you have to engage in live chat with Susan. Okay, here we do actually have a question. Um, great talk, Susan. Can you elaborate on any current research regarding errors, et cetera, that are reduced by interprofessional that are reduced by interprofessional teams, including labs? Thank you for that question. Um, I am not aware of any research in that field right now, which is um, problematic, of course. Um, but it is an opportunity for us to be looking at and perhaps doing some research to document the impact of that. Um, we are kind of in the early ages of this patient safety field, and there's not a lot out there to support it. We're, it's just opportunity for research at this time. Great. Thanks for that answer. And, and again, Susan has graciously agreed to be part of our community of learning following today's presentation. And we have another question coming in. Can you repeat the website for the AHRQ again? Oh, sure. Just a second here. Let me look in my notes. Um, too many notes here. <laughs> I believe it's ahrq.hhs.gov, but I just need to find that. If you um, put in ahrq in your search engine, it'll come up easily. So just try that. Right. Great. We have another question. With the paperless workplace today, what is your suggestion for how to deal with samples that come to the lab without electronic orders? <laughs> without any orders, then. <laughs> uh, I would imagine. Um, well, they would probably in your paperless system, you're going to have to have some kind of paper label on those samples. So your labeling system probably is where you're going to have your fallback as to where they came from and be able to research that. Great. Thank you. Um, I think that's all we have, but the community of learning, um, Susan will be there to um, answer any more of your burning questions about patient safety. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through October of this year, and you'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to any colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you, Susan, for your pre presentation today. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you all.